All right, let's preach. Uh, Today is Palm Sunday. If you grew up in church, today was the day where we literally got palm leaves and used to do this. Anybody remember those old days? Pastor Rocky's old pastor used to ride into their church on a big white horse, (laughs) which that's just the shallow depths of the issues he had in his church as his pastor acted like Jesus. And so today I wanted to preach about Palm Sunday because to me it's such an interesting and unique story. Let's read it in Matthew chapter 21. It says this in verse one, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethhage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed and they brought the donkey and the colt and placed the cloaks on them for Jesus to sit. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches, the palm tree, from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name. Come on, did anyone grow up in church and we used to sing a song, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. All right, obviously I'm the only one that grew up in church. Comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus. This is a key, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple court and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests And the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant, which means they were really angry. The title of my message today is this, is he Messiah or convenient? Is he Messiah or is he convenient? Have you ever bought something and you were expecting one thing and what turned up was totally different, right? Like the internet now. Like have you ever, has anyone here ever gone online dating? And you showed up expecting one thing and you got something else, right? Has anyone bought anything online? Come on, Shopee, Lazada, you bought something and it turned up and it was just totally different than what you were expecting. Do you remember that feeling that you had? There's a young couple in our church, uh, Kim and Josh, and Kim is on our staff. Actually, she's in our uh, youth and young adults department. And just last year, they got married. It was a wonderful wedding. I got to perform this beautiful wedding. And in the excitement of them getting married and moving in together, they began to dream. How could we furnish our new place of living that we will live together, and they're great, they're wonderful, wonderful leaders in our church, and they were praying, they wanted, they wanted to buy like a sofa, a, a lounge suite where people could come, and, and they could disciple them, and love them, and share the gospel with them, maybe even sleep over at night if they had nowhere to sleep. You know, they really pray, they said, God, would you use our, our, would you use our, our sofa, our lounge to touch and reach people? And so Kim found this wonderful lounge online. Let's look at it. Kim, Kim found, wow, doesn't that look beautiful? Kim saw this lounge. She didn't just see a lounge. She, she saw healed lives. She saw tears flowing from the, from the many people that could fit on this large couch that would come in and that fateful day came where the delivery came, they were so excited. Kim, newly married, so excited. 
her man, her husband with her. They stood beside each other as this brand, this brand new tool of evangelism and pastoral care was delivered to their house. And with great expectation, they opened the door. And this is what they found. (laughs) To be fair, they've been able to minister to one person at a time. Because that's all that fits. Have Have you ever bought something and something turns up and it's like that? And you're like, what? This honestly... This is actually what I thought happened with the Israelites. They thought they were getting something, but really they got something else when it came to Jesus. When I was younger, if I was honest, I could never really get my head around this story. I couldn't really comprehend how Jesus could go from hero to villain in one week. This weekend, we celebrate him as king. Next week, we put him on a cross and we kill him. I've never fully understood it, but as I've grown older, the dramatic turn of events that occurred within this next week that we're celebrating, it's become a lot more real and understandable to me. And I think it has to do with how people saw Jesus, what they were expecting from Jesus, and their response when their expectation didn't match the reality that was before them. Let's set the context of this story so we can truly understand it. The Israelites, the the Jews, they were waiting for a Messiah, and there'd been prophecies about this Messiah, the coming king, and over time, they had created an image of what the Messiah would look like, and unfortunately, I believe the image that they created was more of a result of their cultural surroundings than it was a biblical picture of the prophetic words given. And this is maybe a little bit hard for us to understand because we sit here 2,000 years later and we know the story. We, un- we read the book, like we get, if you're in the Philippines, you get the story, right? He died, he rose again, his mother is 100 meters away on the corner of Etza, right? Like we get the story of Jesus, but you have to understand, we gotta read this through the eyes of the Jews that were there. They had a few prophecies, but to your normal average Jew, maybe those prophecies were a bit vague. They had been taken over by Rome and and they'd been subjected to the rulership of Caesar and they are looking for a Messiah. They're looking for a warrior king in the mold of their greatest king, David, who in fact the Messiah would come from that very house, the house of David, and this warrior king would come and free them from the shackles of their oppressors and the rule of their nation. This was their hope and it was their dream. And Jesus comes and he rides in on a donkey. Matthew acknowledges that this is fulfilling a prophecy given in the book of Zechariah. And the people begin to put palm branches. That's why it's called Palm Sunday. Cut big branches, palm, put it on. And not just that, but in Matthew's version of this, they put coats on the ground, and these coats were a sign that royalty was coming. They would lay their coats down so that royalty wouldn't have to stand on the dirty ground, but they could stand on their coats. Maybe some of them wished that Jesus would come in like Rocky's old pastor on a big white horse, but alas, he came in on a little donkey. You know, in traditional Judaism, they never believed that the Messiah would actually be divine. They never believed that the Messiah would actually be God walking amongst them. They believed that the Messiah would be this warrior political leader that would save and they would lead the nation, even though there was prophecies. Isaiah 9 verse 6, we always say this at Christmas time, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. This is a prophetic word about Jesus and the government will be on his shoulders Okay, so he's a leader. So they're thinking, okay, political leader. But it's like they just missed the next bit. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I mean, it's right there in the name. How could they miss it? Just because it's written doesn't mean the revelation had said it. Jesus had told his disciples, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And they were still shocked when it actually happened. 
Just because you read it or just because you hear it doesn't mean you fully get it until revelation comes in. I mean, Isaiah 53 described in detail how Jesus was going to be crucified, and people still didn't get it. This is what I believe. I believe that oppression had blinded the Jews to create a savior that they wanted rather than a savior that they needed. Which leads me to my one and only point today. I've got two sub points, but I've got one main point for today, and it's this. We are created in the image of God. He is not created in our image. The Jews were not looking for God. They were looking for an earthly savior. They were wanting an earthly king, someone to rescue them from Roman occupation instead of this earthly king warrior, they had a man who allowed himself to be arrested, that didn't fight back, that was quiet when accusations were coming against him, that was humble, and he even claimed to be God. And boy, did they turn quickly. Within a week, he went from hero to villain. When they realized that Jesus wasn't who they had created him to be with their minds, they crucified him. Now, Let's bring this into today's context because we can't crucify Jesus anymore. It happened. It already happened. It happened once. That's it. We don't crucify Jesus physically, but I think we kind of crucify Jesus metaphorically today. There's two generally negative responses that people have when it comes to responding to Jesus. This is it. The first one is this, is that people get angry and walk away from Jesus when he doesn't turn out to be who they think he is. Or secondly, they respond by creating their own version of Jesus and making him in our image. These are my two sub points. Let's go with the first one. It's this. We get angry and walk away from Jesus when he doesn't turn out to be who we think he is. 2,000 years ago, it was hurrah, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes In the name of the Lord, son of David, here comes the warrior king to save us. And he failed them. Now, 2,000 years later, this is what we do. Hosanna, blessed is Jesus to come and do something for me that someone has promised that he would do for me, even though it's not really founded in any biblical truths. And when he doesn't do it, we have the same response. And we turn away. And this always ends up coming back to bad interpretation of Scripture, either by us or by someone that's teaching us the Bible. Let's look at just a little example. Psalm chapter 37, verse 4. I love this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Isn't that a wonderful biblical truth? So everyone today, just delight yourself in the Lord, and he's going to give you anything you want. Isn't that wonderful? The desires. Isn't that great? You're all quiet. Good, you know your Bible, because you know that's not the context of that. Because if you read the whole Bible, you understand that Jesus is not Santa Claus. That you don't just delight, oh, I love Jesus. Now can I have this car? Can I have this spouse? Can I have this job promotion? Can I have this wife? Can I have this sofa? (laughs) So what inevitably will happen is, the things that you desire in your heart probably aren't going to happen or they don't happen the way that we thought. And this is where we begin to get angry at Jesus. But Jesus, you said, if I delight in you, well, Jesus never said it. The psalmist said it. If I delight in you, then I'm going to get the desires of my heart. Well, this is a bad interpretation of scripture. You can't just cherry pick this little verse and go, well, this is what it is. You got to go through the whole Bible. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. It talks about how I am a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Literally, the old has died. So, you know, when I become a Christian, my old heart dies and I get a new heart. Ezekiel even prophesies this, where God is going to take your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And when that new heart that you have in Jesus, it will begin to beat in line with the desires that God has. And then we get to 1 John 5, 14, where it tells us that when we ask anything according to his will, he will hear it and he will give it to us. 
So instantly we can see that we don't just delight in the Lord and he gives us anything. We become a new creation. Our old heart goes, our new heart comes. And as we get a new heart, our heart will begin to beat and reflect God. And his desire will become our desire, which then we go all the way back to Psalm. Because if we delight in the Lord, his desire will become our desires. And he will give us the desires of our heart because they are ultimately his desire for us. That is great scripture explanation. But so many times we get the wrong thing. Hey, you name it, you claim it, God's going to give it to you. God's going to give you what we want. And we read the Bible wrong and we get angry when Jesus doesn't match the expectation that we have on him. And this is where sovereignty and trust in God has to come in. Faith in God requires us to trust him. And trusting in God means, it means we have to not lean on our own understanding. And there will be many, I want to just speak this over you. There will be many things that happen in your life with your relationship with God that you will not fully understand and it will require trust. Do I trust that he is who he says he is? Either he's Lord of everything or Jesus is an absolute nutcase. Jesus cannot be just a good man. He can't be not the son of God, but a good man. He can't. Because if he's not the son of God, he's a raving lunatic that is claiming to be God. You can't. Like Jesus is either a crazy person or he is the son of God. And there will be things in life that we don't understand. And that's where we have to trust. Is he who he says he is? Do I trust in the sovereignty of God that even though I may not understand what's going on, I still trust in him and who he says he is? It's hard. Hard times in your life will test you whether or not you trust in the sovereignty of God or whether you've just created your own Jesus. The last eight and a half years, up until uh, last year, uh, Kate and I had walked a journey with Kate's mother, and we've spoken into this a, a couple times, but we walked a journey with Kate's mother who was diagnosed with a terrible, terrible disease called early onset dementia, where in the middle of her 50s, she started losing her thoughts, losing her memories. In the last two, three years, she didn't even recognize her own husband or her own children. And we prayed and we fasted. Kate prayed, Kate fasted, and Kate would have moments where she would be like, God is why? Why is this happening to us? Kate would pray for people in church and they would get healed. And she would go home and her mother was still dying. Like, that's tough. It's in those moments where you really get tested. In those moments where, well, Jesus, you said you're going to heal. How come you're not healing? Jesus, you're not healing. You have these moments in your life where you're really tested. And she would have some moments, and we were talking about this this weekend, and she said she would call her dad. She'd be like, Dad, why, why, is this, why isn't God doing anything? And her father would respond with this. He's a great man of faith, and he would say, well, Kate, we just have to trust in the sovereignty of God. Doesn't mean we're going to understand everything. It means that some things might happen that we don't get. You might look at it and go, well, did, did God make her sick? No, I don't think that's in God's nature in the Bible. But why didn't God heal her? Well, I don't know. That's the mystery box. And if I understood everything about God, he would cease to be God. There are some things I just don't get. For people who have false expectations of who Jesus is, it's usually exposed in disappointment. In fact, this is generally the journey that people take from being in a relationship with Jesus to then deconstructing their faith and no longer walking with Jesus. This whole deconstructing their faith thing, this has become super sexy and popular recently. If you have TikTok or YouTube, you, you will find many people on there deconstructing their faith and telling you everything wrong with what the majority of people have believed for 2,000 years in Christian history. But all of a sudden, in 2024, apparently we have new information. And so uh, this whole thing of deconstructing your faith, this is usually how the journey goes for someone who deconstructs their faith. They, they start with, wow, I love God. I believe in God. Now, the question is, well, what God do you believe in? Because then what begins to happen is, if you believe in God, but it's this God, and then all of a sudden you read scripture, or you hear verses preached from a preacher, 
this subtle change comes in and goes, well, the God I believe in wouldn't do that. And this little subtle changes, and instantly when you make this little subtle change, it, it changes from really accepting the God of the Bible to now, well, I like aspects of the God of the Bible, but there's some aspects I don't like, so I'm gonna keep it over here, and I'm just gonna create this own thing. And then some people will go even farther, and they won't just mix it. They'll then move to this phrase, which is, well, the I could never believe in a God who would. I could never believe in a God that would send people to hell. Well, you're wrong. God doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go to hell when they reject him. I could never believe in a God that allows sickness, that has sickness in the earth. And it's because we've created this weird God that doesn't look anything like the Bible. It basically just looks like a big Santa Claus that makes us feel better about ourselves. Which kind of leads me to my second point, which is this. We create our own version of Jesus. We make him in our image. We end up creating Jesus in our image when the whole time we were supposed to be created in his image. If we don't fully walk away from Jesus, we'll create a Jesus who minimizes sin, a Jesus who doesn't take judgment seriously, a Jesus who never punishes, a Jesus who loves everyone and accepts everyone and agrees with everyone. Massive difference between acceptance and agreement. Jesus accepts everyone. He doesn't agree with everyone. Jesus loves everyone. It doesn't mean that he agrees with what people do. You know what we've ended up doing? Is we've ended up creating an idol. And here's the crazy thing. We've created an idol, but we've put the name of Jesus on the idol. So we're actually not worshiping Jesus of the Bible. We're worshiping an idol Jesus that we've created. And idolatry has been around for a long time. An idol essentially is a false god. A god is anything that you can worship. Uh, an idol can be your money. It can be your family, your career. It can be the love team, your favorite love team. Anything that you worship in the Old Testament, we were told clearly in the Ten Commandments to not have any idols. And, and those were physical idols, wooden carved out idols the Israelites, when Moses went up to receive the Ten Commandments, formed an idol, this cow out of gold. There was physical idols. And here now in our modern day and age, well, in the Philippines, we do still have a lot of physical idols that people have in their houses. But a lot of times, particularly in our Christian church and with a lot of Christians, we may not have a physical idol, but we have idols that have captured our hearts. And we've made these idols, we've made false gods, but we've put the name of Jesus over it and we worship it. Do you know that it's easier for the devil to get church attendees to fall into idolatry than to get them to become atheists? Let, let me explain that. Do you know how hard it is to be an atheist? I have the utmost respect for atheists. Unbelievable. To, to, do you know the faith that it requires to believe that there is nothing. No, 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 seriously, like the, fa I actually, some people are like, oh, you don't like atheists. I love atheists. I wish I had their faith in my God the way they have their faith in nothing. Could you imagine if we all had the same faith that atheists had for our God? They, they believe in, it's, it's a lot easier to believe in at least some cosmic being that created. They believe in nothing. Here we are. It's actually harder to get that. It's easier for the devil to get you coming to church thinking you've punched your ticket to get to heaven, but all the while you're worshiping a Jesus that doesn't exist from the Bible. It's a Jesus that we've created in our own image. It's a lot easier for the devil to get you to do that. You know, John knew how dangerous this was. He writes this incredible letter in 1 John. You should read the whole letter. 
But right at the end, he says this in verse 20, chapter 5. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is a true God and eternal life. So John is basically saying here, he's true. This is Jesus. This is Jesus, not a fake Jesus. This is a true, real Jesus. And then he ends the whole, he doesn't even say goodbye. He doesn't even say farewell, love you. This is how he literally, this is his mic drop moment. John ends it and he says this, dear children, keep yourself from idols. That's it. Like that's, that's actually how it is. That's the last thing he says in this, in, in this book, in this letter. That he understands, keep yourself from idols. Because he knows how dangerous idols can become. Jesus is true. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus, he is the only way, the truth, the Jesus of the Bible. He is a Jesus full of love and also judgment. So children, worship that Jesus. Keep yourself away from idols. Keep yourself away from idols that you and I have built. Keep yourself away from idols that we have created in our own image because we want to be nice people right? Generally, everybody wants to be nice. Do you want to be a nice person? Yeah. So you want your Jesus to be like you. You want your Jesus to be everything that you can't be. I want him to be nice. I want him to do this. I want And listen, listen to me. Jesus is wonderful. He is perfect. He is amazing. His grace and his mercy. Oh. But Jesus will also judge our sin. But this is how wonderful and beautiful Jesus is, is that he gives us grace and mercy that we don't, we do not deserve. He gives it to us. So the judgment will still come, but the grace and mercy is there. That's how beautiful and wonderful Jesus is. We don't need to water this down. In fact, how beautiful and wonderful, how amazing he is, looks even better because of the fact that he will judge. Because of the fact that there is a judgment day coming. Now, have we just created a Jesus that allows us to come to church, sing a few songs, feel safe that we're going to heaven, but then on Monday just believe anything we want? Have we created a Jesus that allows us to get into heaven, but maybe with all the cultural stuff going around in the world right now, we, you know, we just won't really get into it? Have we created a Jesus that allows us to go to heaven? but also allows us just to have any sexual identity or sexual preference that we want. Because the Jesus in the Bible is pretty clear on stuff. But the culture of the world has gotten pretty murky on stuff. And a lot of times our minds, because we're oppressed, just like the Jewish people created a savior that they wanted rather than the savior they needed, because they were blinded by their cultural oppression. So many times we are blinded by our cultural oppression that we want a Jesus that allows us to be accepted by the world and still go to heaven. Whereas Jesus is pretty clear, hey, blessed are those who are gonna be persecuted for my name's sake. You follow the Jesus of the Bible, you won't be super popular in the world. We talked about this a couple weeks ago in church. You, you follow the Jesus of the Bible, there might be some people that don't like what you have to say. You follow the Jesus of the Bible, not your own Jesus you've made up and you know carved a little sign and whacked the name of Jesus. No, no, if you worship the Jesus of the Bible, there will be some things that make your friends angry just like it made some of the Jewish people 2,000 years ago angry. He went from hero, here comes our savior to oh, he's not what we thought, let's crucify him. What's crazy is, is that Jesus actually was the warrior king that the Jews wanted. But instead of saving them from the Romans, he saved them from their sins. Jesus defeated the power of the devil when he allowed himself to be crucified on that cross. He took all the sin that you and I have committed, and that sin separates us from God. Bible's clear, we've all sinned, it separates us from God. And Jesus, when he allowed himself to be crucified, which we're gonna celebrate this Friday, Good Friday, we've got a presence night at Metrowalk at 5 p.m. We're gonna celebrate and sing and worship and pray. 
when Jesus allowed himself to be crucified, he took our sin. But on Sunday, oh, Sunday's coming, everybody. Sunday is coming. On Sunday, he rose victorious, and he had the warrior, our warrior king, Jesus, had defeated the power of sin. So much great. Hey, they didn't need Jesus to defeat Rome. Rome defeated itself. Rome, de- if you know history, Rome defeated itself. But there was only one person that could defeat the power of sin, the power of death, and that was Jesus. And he did it. He did it. He did it. So my question to you today is this. Is Jesus Messiah? Or is he just a convenient addition to your life when you want him? Is he convenient when you need to pray for something? Is he convenient when we have an anointing service? Is he convenient when I need a job promotion and I'll, and I'll go to him and I'll say hi? Or is he Messiah? Because if he's Messiah, it means that he's Lord, not just Savior. And if he's Lord, it means that he owns everything in your life. It means you can't create your own Jesus. It means that you've got to look at the Jesus of the Bible and you've got to go to it and you've got to say, who are you, Christ? Could you shape me? Could you mold me? Could you make me more like you, Jesus? Oh, there's some things I might feel uncomfortable about that's written in scripture, but God, I I believe in you. I trust you. I know that you're sovereign. Maybe I don't culturally understand it through my cultural lens, but, but in a spiritual lens, God, I understand that you own everything, that you see everything, you understand everything. Even if I can't understand it, God, I know that you understand it, and that's our faith and trust. Is he Messiah or is he convenient? So a lot of those Jews, he was just convenient. And when he stopped being convenient, they walked away. I mean, it didn't just happen then. It happened earlier on in his ministry. John chapter 6, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. I call it the the Dracula chapter. Because Jesus had thousands of people following him. And then he gets up and he preaches his Dracula sermon. You want to follow me? You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Right? And if you read it, you know what happened? Many left him. And Jesus turned around to his 12 and he looked at Peter and goes, well, they're all leaving. Are you going to leave too? And Peter got it. Because to the crowd, because the crowd, you always have the crowd. In church, we always have the crowd. To the crowd, Jesus was convenient. And the moment that he got inconvenient, the moment that all of a sudden, wait, I got to eat flesh, I got to drink blood. Wait, what, what? The moment he got inconvenient, they all left. But Peter got it. Jesus looked at him and said, are you going to go? And Peter goes, Lord, where else would we go? Ha, Lord. Who else could I serve? Who else could I follow? It's you. I don't know if Peter fully understand drinking the blood and eating the flesh, but he knew that Jesus wasn't just convenient for him. And even though Peter, you know what I love about using Peter as an example? He made mistakes. He cut off an ear. He denied even knowing Jesus in that moment, but he came back and humbled himself. And Peter was one of the great early church fathers that helped spread the gospel. Why? Because Jesus wasn't convenient to him. Jesus was his Messiah. But today, is he your Messiah? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? In a moment, we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for everyone in a moment that feels like maybe they have created their own version of Jesus. Maybe you didn't realize it. And the hard thing about idolatry is that, you know, we, we haven't put up a new statue of Jesus and start, you know, it's it's... What captures your heart? Maybe there's things that you've been worshiping above God in your life, or maybe you just created a, a Jesus that just allows you to do whatever you want with no conviction. And Jesus is just love. Yes, Jesus is love. He is the very definition of love, and it's because he loves you. He also has boundaries. I'm going to pray for that in a second, but before that, i got to ask you, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Maybe you're here. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you've never come to that point where you've acknowledged the sin that separated you. Maybe you've 
You've never acknowledged that Jesus is more than just a great historical figure or a great prophet, but that he is the son of God. In his own words, that he is the only way, the truth, and the life, that you cannot get to God through your money, through your good works, even through your knowledge. You can only get to God through Jesus Christ. Acknowledging, Paul writes in Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, not just Savior, but Lord, he owns my whole life. Aha! Then Paul writes, you will be saved. If you're here and you've never done this before, or maybe you did this a long time ago, but you walked away from God, I want to give you a chance to respond. If you're online, I want to give you a chance as well. Can we just bow our heads, close our eyes for a moment? You're saying, James, that's me. I'm that first person. I've never done this. Or you're saying, James, I'm that second person. I did this a long time ago. If that's you, I'd love you on the count of three to lift up your hands because I want to pray for you right where you are. And if you're watching or you're listening on one of our podcasts, you do it because Jesus will see you and that's what matters the most. If that's you on the count of three, you lift your hands. One, two, three, right now, all over this room. Thank you. I see hands up the back. Thank you, Jesus. Here, hands here. A couple hands on the side here. Thank you, Lord. A couple hands up the back. Hand over here in the middle. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, wonderful Lord. Hey, if you lifted your hand, this is what I want you to do. A hand over there on the side. If you lifted your hand, I want you to put your hand on your heart right now. We're all going to pray this prayer together. But those that lifted their hands, I really want you to mean these words with me. And it's a simple prayer reflecting what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 10. So come on, why don't we say this together? Say, dear Lord Jesus, come to you right now. And I ask you to forgive my sin. I believe that you died on the cross, but you defeated death and you rose victorious. You broke the power of sin. So right now I ask, please come into my life. Be my savior, but be Lord of my whole life. Make me a new creation. Let my heart reflect your heart. In your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise for every person that just prayed that prayer?